Now, unquestionably, one of the most difficult aspects of any science course, but especially anatomy and physiology, is terminology. In our case, the jargon is literally Greek, or Latin, I guess. But it serves a purpose, because it allows us to talk about things in a high level of detail with a lot of specificity. So I'll be introducing a lot of vocabulary over the course of the semester. But one example that we can talk about right now is the location of structures inside the body. These photos are trying to represent a crime scene. Fortunately, I don't think it's a real crime scene, but you get the idea. If the medical examiner were to describe this scene by saying, like, well, I found him, he was on his back, and he had a gunshot wound somewhere on his left side, kind of in the middle, like around his rib, that wouldn't be helpful, right? It would be the worst episode of Law & Order SVU ever produced. The medical examiner might know exactly what she was talking about herself, but what would happen if she were to go on vacation or get fired from the show? And another medical examiner had to try to interpret what she was describing. Wouldn't work. So using more precise terms allows us to describe things in enough detail where we wouldn't have to physically be present or even have pictures in order to understand what was happening. The other major problem that we have when it comes to location is the fact that we're mobile and flexible organisms. We can contort our bodies into all sorts of different positions, and that would lead to inaccuracy when describing the location of something to someone else. So to try to correct this problem whenever possible, we describe structures by assuming that the body is in a standardized anatomical position and that position, even though it can vary by species, is unique to humans. So for humans, we assume that a person is standing up, that they have their feet together and facing parallel to each other, that they have their arms at their sides and their palms are facing outward, and that their head is level with their eyes facing forward. Additionally, whenever we locate structures on a person, we always define the location from the perspective of the subject. So, for example, anatomical left would refer to the left side of the individual and not my left field of view. Additionally, we also have specialized terminology to describe different regions of the body. This is going to be especially important in the laboratory portion of the course when you're learning about the muscles and the skeletal system. So structures that are associated with the trunk of the body, like the head, the neck, the chest, the spine, those are all referred to as axial structures. Structures that are not associated with the trunk, like arms, legs, those are classified as appendicular structures, referring to the fact that they're located on appendages. Now, in some cases, we could break things down even further for even more accuracy. So, for example, if you were having pain in your abdomen, your physician would try to determine whether the pain was coming from your upper right quadrant, which might indicate gallbladder, your left upper quadrant, which might indicate a liver problem, your lower right quadrant, which might indicate appendicitis, or your lower left quadrant, which might indicate some kind of intestinal problem. Now, it's quite common in gross anatomy to locate structures based upon their relative position to other structures. These are the so-called terms of position, but the thing is that they're not absolute. In other words, there's really no such thing as a superior structure. A structure can only be superior in relation to something else. Another thing that can be really tricky about terms of position is that there are often multiple ways to locate the same structure, and that creates a little bit of a gray area. So in the textbook, there are some really good images and explanations of all of these terms, so I would refer you to that for a more in-depth explanation, and I'm only going to briefly review them here. It's important to note also that each of these terms of position is paired with another antagonistic term. So, for example, superior refers to something that's located further up on the body towards the head, whereas the term inferior describes something that's located a little bit further down. The term anterior describes something that's closest to the front, whereas the term posterior refers to something that's closest to the back. Now, in humans, the term anterior is usually the same as the term ventral, which means closest to the stomach. 
Similarly, the term posterior usually also can be used interchangeably with dorsal, which refers to closest to the back. Structures that are located on the midline of the body are said to be medial, whereas structures that are located further away from the midline of the body are said to be lateral. Structures that are located closest to the point of attachment, so this is usually applied for appendages, are referred to as proximal, whereas structures that are located very far away from the point of attachment are referred to as distal. So the best way to get comfortable with these terms of position is really to practice locating different structures on your own body. Pick two structures and try to describe their relative locations using some of the terms in these diagrams. One last complication is that not all of these structures are visible on the body. And that's where the terms on this slide, which describe anatomical sections, become useful. As humans, we have bilateral symmetry, which means that we could be divided into roughly equal left and right halves down an imaginary midline. If we were to make a cut down this imaginary midline, that would be known as a mid-sagittal cut. If we were to make a different cut in that same plane, so divide ourselves into unequal left and right portions, that would be known as a sagittal cut or a sagittal section. We could also divide the body into front and back. That would be known as a coronal section cut in this plane, dividing myself into non-symmetrical front and back halves. We could also make cuts that divide things into top and bottom. That's known as a transverse section or a cross section. Thinking about anatomical sectioning can provide some helpful frames of reference when we're learning about gross anatomy, but it's especially necessary when you're looking at some of the internal anatomy of the body. You just wouldn't be able to see it without making a cut. So many of the images that you'll be looking at in the laboratory are going to require sectioning, and when that section is made, it'll often be noted in their caption.